Good evening. Welcome to the second screening of the 2014 Understanding Taiwan through film and documentary series. I'm Zhang Yu. Welcome to um, this lovely event because we have seen so many different faces, new faces. That's really uh, encouraging. Um, tonight's film is Tons of Heaven, and we are delighted to have the film's director, Anita Chang, uh, with us tonight. So let's give her a round of applause. Thank you. Okay. Um, I will have to ex sorry, introduce her properly again after last night because quite a different uh, group of people here. Anita is an independent uh, filmmaker. She's a teacher and also a, a freelance writer. And she has involved in many uh, uh, arts projects and also has taught in many places in the world. Uh, she traveled a lot. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, this uh, particular film is quite close to her, her heart. Tons of Heaven is her collaborated uh, work with four young women from Taiwan and also from Hawaii. Uh, recording their personal personal quest for their linguistic identity. It all started from Anita's uh, res um, residency in, in Donghua or her teaching in Donghua University in Hualien uh, when her student talked about her their regret uh, of not being able to uh, speak their own mother tongue. And equip equipped with a simple video camera they set out to explore their own roots. Uh, depicting these four women from two different uh, locations across the ocean, the film is a human jigsaw embodying the predicament that faced minority people and their language and the cultural uh, difficulties under the influence of globalization. Before the screening, of course, uh, Anita would have uh, would like to talk to you a little bit about her film, but just before her start, <laughs> sorry, you know my drill. Uh, I will have to, and also we are grateful, uh, on behalf of the Center of Taiwan Studies, we would like to thank Ministry of Culture and also the very generous donation from uh, Dr. Uh, Samuel Ying. Without their uh, generous support, we will, wouldn't be possible to put on this series of events. So um, thanks for the uh, official support uh, and the money, of course, is very welcome. So now, uh, let's uh, welcome Anita and have a few words for us. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you so much for showing up uh, on a Friday night <laughs> for uh, to watch an independent film. And uh, this is a labor of love. Um, took about five years to make um, because uh, you know I, I, I had to think about the movie for about two years, um, but then I edited the movie in three weeks. So uh, that's how I sort of operate. Um, I think the, the, the topics uh, the, in, in, in the, the work is very complex, and all the four women have very different stories, and I kind of wanted to foreground that, that our, each person's relationship to language um, it's very, very personal and intimate, and it's not something you can generalize. Um, not, not like, you know, you can generalize things, but I mean, I just felt like uh, the collaborative approach uh, was important, um, as a, also as a formal device to, um, to, a, to a documentary. So hopefully you might, you might be able to notice some of that. Um, yeah, and I also just wanted to uh, thank David. Um, I think it's been fun, right? They always say, you know, as a certain just being able to um, meet such wonderful people from the Taiwan Center, Center of Taiwan Studies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, so I wanted to thank also everyone who helped to, you know, uh, make this event possible. Um, it's been really great to be here in London. It's my first time here. Um, so um, it's great to have a comparison between sort of U.S. attitudes and attitudes here, and of course, we're in a cosmopolitan city here in London, um, and I think uh, uh, language is, 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 is an issue that uh, I think many of us have grappled with at least one time in life, if not uh, continuing to grapple with it. Okay, so, just so. Thank you. Yeah, as a linguist, 
I'm interested and wonder whether the, uh, the uh, creation of a script for organization is an important part of the uh, preservation and learning. If there isn't a written script, um, then it would be much more difficult to teach the language, except by the direct method of just listening. The oral right, exactly. Yeah. Um, well, you, did you see the books that the, the women were sharing? So those are the kind of the yes, romanization. Yeah. So which language is that? Please? That's both Tuluku and uh, Wukai. And so they are, it's, it's Romanized script. Um, and much of it was taken from the Bible. Yeah, and the mission yeah. is playing a big part. It's right. not translated into the Bible. So yes. In order to translate the Bible, they need the script. Yes, yes. And it's not mentioned specifically, but um, Kainoa does refer to it with the Hawaiian language when she was learning the Hawaiian language in an institution like the University of Hawaii. It was very different than learning from her grandfather. And she was getting con conflicting sort of structural sort of, you know, ways of speaking. And that was difficult, the, the book, uh, you know, learning it from the book versus from her grandfather, yeah, in the field, so to speak. So. What about the cultural heritage in Poems and songs and, and literature of some kind. Is that in Taiwan or Hawaii? Well, I'm thinking of the yeah in Taiwan. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, it, and her um, Anchi's uncle. They were uh, singing. They have a family chants, and that is you know using the Lukai language. And of course, Anchi can't understand a word of what they're saying, but yeah. she's um, you know she's she's making um, oh. You, Louder? Okay. Can you just stand She's here? Probably better. Yeah. Oh, Sorry okay. about that. Yeah. I, so, I feel so. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's like a strange authoritarian kind of. Okay. Um, yeah. Maybe I'll just do this. Yeah. So um, yeah, she uh, just she can't understand a word of it, but she's uh, you know she's a filmmaker, so she's been doing quite a lot of documentation just in terms of uh, cultural events, um, some activist work. So it's definitely involved in the community in that way, in her, in her village. Um, but I don't think she's, um, I, I think she's decided that she's not going to learn it. And it's, uh, Rukai is, uh, at this point, she's decided not to. Uh, Rukai language is actually really, really difficult to learn. I don't know if there's any Rukai speakers or anyone studying the Rukai language, um, but I think like saying hello is like 30 syllables. You know, and like, we just, hello, or hey, you know, one syllable, I think. Aloha, I don't know, three syllables. I mean, but it's like this kind of, you know, really a beautiful poetic, like poetic language. You know. um, I used to live in the Pacific Northwest, and there are many, many uh, indigenous languages there. And linguistic anthropologists were in a desperate race to record them. Someone was having one native speaker left. You know. Right. Very sad. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's uh, a case today now, just ongoing. I don't know if you've seen the movie The Linguists. I haven't seen it yet, but um, yeah. Get my hands on that. Daniel here. Um, I'm doing MA Taiwan Studies here, mm -hmm. so. Um, I found quite interesting at the, the end of the, I think it's a mother, she said, I blame the Ministry of Education because, because the kids weren't allowed to speak their mother language. But now in Taiwan, the Ministry of Education has kind of switched and all kids are expected to learn their, their mother language, whether it's Taiwanese or one of the Aboriginal languages. How much would you say that that is an answer to preserving these languages, as yeah. opposed to within the societies themselves? Yeah, I mean, when I was living there, it was, it was a really complicated issue because they were trying to encourage um, um, the students to, if they, if, they spo if they could pass an exam, of their um, indigenous language, then they would get extra points for admission into college, right? So that was sort of to encourage the young people to um, to kind of make an effort. The, the problem is that the, the young Taiwanese, um, uh, especially the indigenous students, would learn languages where there were teachers. So it was not necessarily their own language, but uh, for example, if uh, let's say your native tongue is Sokaranganabu, uh, like Yen Fen, uh, she, but then the Bunun population is large, so she would be able to, she's actually fluent in Bunun, which is interesting, yeah, just because there's just more people, and, um, but you can 
learn, pick up another language, and be able to just um, study for the exam, and then get those extra points. And I think, uh, at least my students when I was there, they, they mentioned that it was just not effective, and not really getting to the, to, to the heart of the issue, right? So, and then finding teachers was really difficult. Where I was teaching in Hawaii and in the East Coast, um, they actually had to pay for the, um, the elders to come to the, to the you know, plains and to teach the students. So uh, it, it's, there's a challenge, you know, whether or not institutionalized uh, learning of these minority languages is the way to go. Don't really know, but sort of, they're still trying to you know, work it out. Um, but there have been hot debates, like for example, um, is should we make, uh, should we regulate when students in Taiwan learn English? It should not be before six, for example. And then there's this whole why, you know, and it's like, well, because it's shaping their minds, they're already starting to think in English then. And it's very controversial, and it's the heated debate that's going on all the time. I'm not sure where, at this point, the policy stands on that. Um, but I remember my students saying that they couldn't, they didn't really start learning English until maybe middle school, or a little bit in maybe elementary, but usually middle school and, and high school. Yeah, now we'll see that that's the whole controversy. Like, do we want kids to start learning at that age? Um, yeah. yeah. But very lively, lively debates, for sure. Yeah. Yes. Uh, my last question about safety languages, yeah, whether it is necessarily the right thing to do, because we talk about yeah, keeping the language alive, but if the language isn't developing, is it really alive? Or are you just keeping it there? Uh, just like we see these indigenous people standing there for the photo opportunity with the tourists, you know. It's all just stage and costume drama. It's, and it's just keeping the language alive. Are you really keeping the traditions alive? There? And then we call the folk stuff which will go with the language. What I'm trying to say is the young people might be more interested in learning their languages if the language was still developing. You know, there's new words coming into the language. You know, it's about, you know, you must make it precious and oh, this is the language. And, Nothing else can come into it. Twenty of uh, that, yeah, in danger of doing that with their own language, of not allowing foreign words into their language to develop it. Mm. So I'm wondering if this whole thing is about preserving the language in the same way to preserve the native dress and the cultures just for the tourists, or is it really going to be properly used and developed as a real language? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, again, I think you you sort of touched that complex the issue is. And I think for every community, it's, it's different. You know, I, I kind of wanted to show a little bit, uh, to make that comparison between Hawaii, who has, the, who has a very um, committed revitalization um, movement, and it was, you know, um, under a lot of duress and struggle, actually. They kind of encountered lots of um, um, obstacles, you know, and, and it, was, it was totally grassroots. It was a group of people that decided that we're going to do this and who cares about the you know, Department of Education in the United States, they're not going to give us any funding for this. So they did it on their own. And it was a small group of people, you know. And so you're not going to have everyone that's going to buy into it, certainly. And then the, the, way, the, the, one, the way a community approaches language revitalization is also very unique, too. And when I guess when you, when you ask the question about developing, I'm not really sure what you mean by that. But I mean, cha you know, languages are, they're working, changing all the time. It's not some static thing. They're, you know, um, but th then it made me think of Hebrew, which was, you know, completely revitalized. Um, and also, there's been some um, some work being done in the United States as well, um, where there's no speakers at all, and then, you know, going through the Bible and kind of reconstructing the language through these documents and and and, and making it, um, you know, a, a viable a medium of communication and, um, you know, uh, uh, their own journey. I mean, it's really, you know, pretty quick. It's quite fascinating, you know. Yeah, one of the points I'm trying to aim at is that the usefulness of the language dropped off, and that's why the language dropped off. You know, it's why people stopped probably to learn it from their parents, because it was, it was more useful to learn Mandarin, and English needs to become the language of government and trade. I don't and think it's, I think it's not, I mean, I don't think it's a matter of being convenient. Um, I mean, they were forced to not speak such language. So then when you're looking at it as a whole, then it seems like it's not useful because you're yeah. being told and you, um, that if you speak such language, you're sort of singled out 
in a whole group of people. That's and why you are less educated, and therefore you, you shouldn't be doing that, because what you want to do is to fit in in a community. And so when it's such a long time, like for a whole generation, where they know their parents were suppressed and they were being abandoned to go up and live in the mountain, um, then of course it's very easy for these next generation to think they don't want to learn it because why should I go into a society my skin color is already darker, therefore I should just try to blend in and not speak such language. And so I don't think it's the same way as how you think. I can see it really aroused passion. Yes. <laughs> yes. And yes, of course. I think you got an, uh, a question. Uh, I'm on the MA course for uh, endangered languages, mm -hmm. and I'm quite interested in maybe doing my PhD on revitalization at the Taiwan. So I was wondering how I can get involved. In that. <laughs> oh my God! Oh, talk to us. And you, you can start, well, I mean, I have um, some close colleagues that I could definitely be nice. Yeah. That they, I'm sure they would love to, yeah, they're just a great resource to, they'll probably kick your brain, see what you're interested in, and find the best route for you. Yeah. There's quite a lot of efforts, actually, yeah. to put into it, but, you know, yeah. sometimes it is not that there's no intention, but it's how to do it, how to get around difficulties because that it is in danger. So there are, as you said, there are some bigger tribes and smaller tribes. And there's also differences of accents. So even the same tribe, this village is different from that village. Yeah. So who should be standardized? So which one to pick? So there's that quite that a lot of political issues as well. I've been in Guernsey, I've so I've experienced the politics and the kind of you know, which language should go in a dictionary and so on. Yeah, they're fascinating topics. We are looking forward to, to, to read it, reading it. So, any questions? Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm doing my PhD on uh, Sakazaya, so language spoken. Oh. Oh. Do you know me? Uh, no. Oh, okay. <laughs> Introduce, yeah. yeah, yeah. You have yeah. To. I, I, went, I was staying in Hawaii last year. Oh. I'm going back there this year to do my, my field research. And I was just thinking, uh, she, you were at Dong Hua University, right? Yes. And, so, and, and she was, was Yeah, there were students there, yeah. You said that she's not interested in learning language, mm -hmm. but she's, is she still studying like revitalization? Oh, there? no. No, she was uh, initially. Just yeah. don't work. She was, um, she went into, the, the department I was teaching in is uh, called um, Department of Indigenous Languages and Communication. Yeah. So most of the students who um, enroll there actually think that they can learn their indigenous languages when they are there. But then they realize, at least for her, the, the Rukai, and the Rukai instructor is great. He's just a wonderful man. I think she wanted more something more rigorous, where she can, within two years, be able to speak, or at least something, but she couldn't pick it up, and it was very difficult. And like I said, I think like if you're learning a language as a second language, and not everyone has a knack for languages, too. See, that's, that's another thing, is it, it might be difficult to pick up language, although she could speak uh, Minayu, Taiwanese, and Mandarin, right, because she's in Dong, but um, she's having a hard time with Bukai. And then, so then, then she got more really philosophical about it. The, the way you saw the movie, the way I edited it, is actually chronological. So she started to kind of change over the course of two, three years when we were making this, where she started to, to just say, you know what, what, what about a language deserves to be saved. Uh, just like arbitrarily when we say, well, the white-faced squirrel, you can't hunt it anymore, but you can kill the boar once a week. You can hunt that. Like, who made that decision like this? Because it looks more distinctive, and or why this language and not that language? Why? So she's kind of getting more at uh, sort of the, the philosophical thing. Part is essentially what it comes down to is it's, it's, it's up to the community whether or not they want to use it. If, if the community of native speakers feel like the language is important, then they want to keep it. It's a human rights issue essentially for us to, or for someone to step in to help them by being language, revitalization, documentation, and providing resources. If, if you say no, then you're essentially, you're, you're by ignoring it, you're, you're contributing to a kind of cultural Genocide, which is really strong. Well, it's, it's, well, not, not, if it, not, not if it's enforced through educational 
policies like it was back in the 50s. Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that that's an inaccurate description, but yeah. it's new. But I think like what you were saying too about value. When you grow up um, feeling like your culture's devalued, including its language, including the color of your skin, how you look like, then you want to speak perfect Mandarin. I mean, that's, and my students, can they can really speak perfect Mandarin, and then they'll go into the lazy Taiwanese, then they'll do the Beijing accent. They're really, they're hilarious. They'll go into like, you know, and then they'll go into their indigenous, you know, they mix it up, and they speak English, and they, they have a lot of fun with it. But I mean, they're kind of also poking fun at the pressure to speak perfect, this kind of, you know, um, Beijing Mandarin. So, um, but yeah, I think that, the way we feel about our language is one of the causes of. I mean, from I only yeah. spoke to a few of the Aboriginal people um, that my family knows, and from my understanding, is that um, they mentioned the lack of um, the urge to learn their particular language, their younger generation, is that they they try each tribe were dispersed, you know, from each other, and they were to go up the mountain or to the coast or somewhere actually quite dangerous. And so all they could do was to survive, and to do that was not to speak their language and to just get through life and then to have the next generation. And so, and hence, you can see many parents didn't want to speak the language to their children. They think, well, what if they get in trouble like I did? They're probably not as strong as me. And so I think that caused yeah, they always what say happened a week later. Yes, exactly. And so, yeah, so I think that's one of the biggest problems because like in Hawaii or such places there although not many people, um, but sort of enough and the, the places they live they support each other. Whereas the, the ones that we see in Taiwan um, from my here is that they are a mixed tribe. So let's say if you get hundred of them, within that one hundred they probably have four tribes. And so none of them sort of say, well, you're going to speak ours. So they sort of say, OK, let's just get through this. <laughs> so I think it's slightly different. Well, language, there's nothing yes. really absolutely right or wrong. Your accent's mm -hmm. better than mine. Okay. You know, it's always making up uh, along the way. So I can understand. Yeah, so, um, so policy does matter. So I think David has some yeah. questions. I, I was just uh, wanted to kind of follow up on one of Daniel's questions. Okay, we've got this uh, increase in native language education. But the other um, simultaneous trend is an increase in spending on um, broadcasting, public broadcasting of mm -hmm. language other than Mandarin, uh, uh, public television, radio Taiwan, international, and a lot of um, um, uh, languages. And of course, we're going to have stuff with the uh, Yuan Zhu Ming mm -hmm. uh, yes, yeah, yeah. Um and I was wondering to what extent this actually helps, because if you think about, for example, language, uh, the revival of Welsh, a key yeah. feature is Do you think it uh, Welsh did, TV. Did it help? Uh, I think it's definitely had a big yeah. impact, that was my impression. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, to what extent did this come up in your conversations? No, it definitely, I mean, I was there when they mm -hmm. started um, the Indigenous television and visited them several times. And I think the, the issue with Taiwan and Hawaii, for example, Hawaii is one language. Taiwan has many languages, and still there's new ones cropping up, like part of the, you know, kind of the Thai, um, mm -hmm. the, the language family, right? So you have like Tulu, so that's that's the issue in this, you know, at least when I looked at the stations and I talked to you know, some of my students, and they said, well, you get a half hour of Bukai at 10, mm -hmm. that's it. And then they switch to another language, and then it's, you know, and that's all you get, and so it's a little difficult. So it's not actually in terms of things like drama, which might actually attract the interest. <laughs> well, they're trying to do like more <laughs> animation. <laughs> but <laughs> I got this whole thing. It's really, because they're also trying to find speakers to, you know, to get involved and, um, you know, participate. But you've only got one station. And, you know. Let's take two questions. Front first, then. OK, so, uh, um, Could I you know. tell us your name? Sorry. My yes, yes uh, Matt, so Matt, Matt Davis. Um, uh, I thought it was great film because I think it does capture that tension between um, the, the, the need to preserve identity and ethnic cultural identity and the need to kind of prosper and get on. And that's not just people learning, but also parents, mm. actually, which language they decide to teach to their children. Uh, yeah. um, so, so it captures it beautifully, I thought. 
Um, but, but what about the solution? So actually they went to Hawaii, and I was quite interested to see the, what, what, could you tell us a bit more about the, the school situation? That so obviously they were learning in Hawaii in, in the classroom. It actually looked, I mean, maybe naively to me, it looked like it was not just um, ethnic Hawaiians, but actually quite a mixed group. Mm -hmm. I mean, could you say something about that? Yeah, actually, the, the language revitalization um, in, in Hawaii is actually attracting um, local people who are not ethnically Hawaiian. Yeah, exactly. So they feel, the parents feel like there's a value for their child if they made their home in Hawaii, especially the Big, uh, the big Island, right? So, um, especially in Hilo. Um, that they 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 want that they want to put the child in an immersion program. And so it's a choice of, of the parent, yeah. And it's uh, you walk in there and it's uh, it's pretty amazing, you know. So you've got these high school kids studying like you know there's a that was a science class you know in Hawaiian. And I think there were two or three um, PhD dissertations that have been written in Hawaiian. Yeah, just wow. uh, yeah, and it may be even more than that. Now, but when I was there, yeah. So there's um. There's a really kind of um, you know push for that, but I you know it's interesting because Haoli, the woman in my film, still feels that it's really um, it's still not safe. She she really feels that it's endangered because they constantly come up with um, with uh, obstacles, you know. And I think, for example, um, the idea of a bilingual immersion education. I mean, just that concept. Most people are against it. I mean, in the United States, absolutely. They're like, what? Spanish, English bilingual? I mean, California which has a huge Spanish-speaking population, and also um, now Mandarin and Cantonese, and you see these schools cropping up, but um, most, most taxpayers are like, I'm not paying for this. You know, this has got to be a private school, or, and they protest, you know, like, I mean, it's really kind of quite contentious. And they don't understand, they think, wait, so if a child grows up with two languages, how can they master one, they wouldn't be good in one. They have to, they just have sort of, you know, tangential knowledge of both, and. I, I wouldn't want my kid to, you know, experience, have that, you know. Right? You are the best example of the act proven that they wrong. Because you are quite good with Chinese, Mandarin, or Well, but that, you know, I don't know. I don't know. You know, and, you know um, a little bit. How come? No? No, no. no. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yes. Um, do I have to say my name as well? Or? Yes. Oh, <laughs> did you? Did you? Um, okay, well, I'm Johnny, and I study, um, BA Anthropology and History of Science, and I found the scene where you were in the park that was kind of used to reserve the culture very interesting, that scene. Um, but most of the tourists were Taiwanese, and how much to the Taiwanese population who aren't necessarily indigenous have this idea that rather than it being about a kind of contemporary societal issue of a lot of cultural identity, that it's actually more about a historical preservation of the indigenous people. Oh, yeah. See, that particular park is, is interesting. I don't know the entire history of it, but it definitely had this um, facade of, uh, well, you, I don't even know how to describe it. I, th I think you know what it's like. I mean, it's definitely for tourists. But it's supposed to also energize the local economy. Um, and so, and then you have, um, I had students that, you know, would, be, would work there, you know, and then th they would just say, well, it's to make money. And they have mixed feelings. They feel on the one hand, um, it's, it's definitely not authentic. On the other hand, when they perform, they don't want to be crazy either. They want to give a sense of, they have pride too, right? And so it's a, it was a real mix. And it's, it's, for me, I, I thought that scene was, was just important to, to get us to think about what does it mean when you, you feel like um, if, you, if, you, if there's some economic value to your existence, like your language would also, it's just exactly what the, the auntie said, your language would also then have value. So what gives the Hawaiian language, for example, value for those who are not ethnically Hawaiian and parents wanting to, you know, uh, put their kids in a bilingual immersion program, right? And tap, what would keep that, you know, language alive? And of course we know Hawaii is a tourist destination, um, for one, right? And so um, whether or not that draws, you know, other people to want to learn that language, I mean, it's just kind of food for thought, like, you know, who, who, who decides um, how value is, is placed on, on something, in like a language or culture. Yeah, and I just, I just, I just thought that it, that park had a lot of bizarre things going on. And it was just, um, you know, these wax figures to this guy who's like <laughs> half comatose, probably tired, I didn't, I didn't even know. 
but that, that's what I found interesting. Yeah. So for the Taiwanese, like in Taiwanese media, for example, would it would the this kind of struggle to keep the language alive be seen as something of trying to preserve something from history, or is it actually seen as the Taiwanese people as more of a kind of okay, this is a contemporary societal issue, and people are losing the culture? Uh, are using their culture. Losing their culture. Losing, losing sorry. Their culture. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I mean, I think uh, uh, all of this is is only possible because of Taiwan's post-coloniality. Its conditions of post-coloniality really is why all of this is even possible. To even talk about language, even implement a you know, like a, a department, like to begin a department or put up a department that's called Department of right, Indigenous Languages and Communication, um, to even just have that. Um, so I think, yes, it's definitely, you know, a sort of a statement that, yeah, our culture is important, but also, what have we suppressed during these colonial times? You know, what is it? What can we unearth and um, you know, sort of think about what, what we want to be, what we want to become? You know, so I think it's, it's this idea of uh, you know, Anchi's uncle saying, well, if the Ruka language is, is disappeared, if, if it does disappear, then who will we become? Uh, Mandarin speakers in order to what? I mean. You know, it's kind of easy to open. And as I did, her father said, uh, if the Rukai language is lost, then the world will not be whole. I thought that was like so, and he's like yeah, trying to fix the, he's like not even, like, he's just, the house is about to fall into the river, right? And he's like fixing this thing, and he's kind of like, <laughs> you know, and she's like uh, laughing, you know. But I was like, wow, that's so yeah. profound to me. And I wanted to open the movie with that, you know. I think, we're, we're sort of run out of time, but we, we... Oh, one more question? Oh, I, I, I'm so sorry. Yes, let your uh, question be the concluding one. No pressure. Yes. Um, my name is Marina. Um, and well, I was a bit writing all those from the invasion programs, but I wonder how sustainable they are, because I think if language can really survive the spoken of scene and the day-to-day environment, and I can see it from, from Germany where we have a similar issue with low German, but oh, it's not the same. Yeah. Um, which supposedly to be my mother tongue, but I can't speak. Yeah. Yeah. And we have all sorts of after school activities, and it's fun participating in that, but after you are sort of out of that environment, you know, becoming really fluent, and then you forget already what you learned, but you will never really be able to tell them to your children. So I'm just wondering how sustainable they are. I mean, is there, do they actually then try to teach their own children once they become fluent in language? Or? Yeah, I mean, I think those are all just really good questions. And we can only look at examples. I mean, for example, Hebrew. Like, how did that in today continue to be a, you know, a really kind of robust living language from with no one speaking it to, right? So you can look at different models. And, you know, I think that, um, you know, this idea of, right, um, you need speakers, you need to be speaking all the time and hearing it. And, um, you know, and of course, language fluency is so, it doesn't matter, it doesn't mean that you have to be really fluent in a language, right? You can be conversant and communicating and, uh, um, and still um, get a lot from being, speaking and speaking, and being in that community and speaking, right? It doesn't, I mean, I mean, when you say sustainable, I mean, I guess I understand what you sort of mean. Um, but on the other hand, it's, um, yeah, I mean, I guess it's It is so a different. difficult question, isn't it, really? I mean, I she's mean, a filmmaker. She's not, not a <laughs> linguist, no, at least. No, I mean, you know, <laughs> I no, enough in the movie, too. They're not too, bad, as, you know, the yeah. linguistics, uh, in terms yeah. of, you know, it is, the, the big question everyone's after. So I think maybe, you know, we can um, ask Anita later uh, when you are over a, a, a glass of wine or something <laughs> like others. Okay, thank you very much thank for you coming. So much.